I'm Joe from As the Joe Flies. And I'm Leslie from Trips with Tykes. And welcome back to Disney Deciphered. So on today's episode, Disney has opened up 2025 for Walt Disney World booking four months earlier than normal. And so we're going to talk about some of the things that they're offering, some of the changes that they've made, and you know, talk a little bit about whether 2024 or maybe 2025 is the year to go if your family's planning a trip in the next couple of years. Before we get started, though, Leslie, we do have a new Patreon subscriber to thank. So who do we got? Yes, we are thanking Nicole, our newest Patreon supporter. If you want to support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash Disney Deciphered. And there we have all sorts of extra content for our supporters, trip reports, unfiltered episodes, and ad-free listening as well. So thanks to everybody who's supported and thanks to our newest supporter as well. Two things to say, Leslie. Number one, to everyone who is listening to this who is a Patreon supporter, if I have not released the Tokyo Disneyland conversation that Leslie had with one of our Patreon supporters, you have permission to email me. If by the time you're listening to this, I haven't done that yet, please bother me about that. That's going to be a bonus, bonus episode. I'm just a little bit outside the norm, but Leslie had a lot of fun doing that. I haven't listened to it yet as we are recording this. And the second thing is, Leslie, we had a one-time donation for the first time in a long time. So we also want to thank Kyle C for your one-time donation. If you check out the Patreon page, you should be able to see a link or actually in in the show notes as well, if you want to give us a one-time donation. Anyway, Kyle, thank you so much for your donation. We really appreciate it. And we really appreciate all our supporters. Okay. Got all that out of the way. Let's talk about 2025, Leslie. As of right now, 2025 is bookable through the month of October. Disney is not doing the thing where they're doing rolling dates and like you can book on November 1st and then November 2nd, November 3rd. It's just through October right now. Probably not going to get November and December until maybe this summer. Although who knows since, like I said before, they open things up for booking so much earlier. So let's talk about some of the changes. Let's start with the most fun ticket price increase. First time in a year or two. One nice thing is that They only increased the ticket prices for 2025. In the past, they used to like increase all the prices at once. So it's good that it's only a 2025 increase. The big headline news is that the most expensive day at Magic Kingdom is now over $200, which is bananas. But Leslie, I looked up a couple of ticket pricing to see the difference between 2024 and 2025. Why don't you share that with the listeners? Sure. So we priced out four-day park hoppers. So looking at June in 2024, That's $705, and then in 2025, it becomes $734. So it's a 4.2% increase in the price of a four-day park hopper between those two years. And looking at October, in 2024, it's $733, and then in 2025, it's $773, so a 5.5% increase. So I guess I guess that's what inflation is these days, Joe. Is it about four or five percent or maybe even more than that? Maybe it's not even keeping up with inflation in these inflationary times, but definitely quite a quite a hefty little little bump there. I mean, I guess it's nice because that's like not nice, but it's been a year and a half or so since the last price increase. And then like we said, the 2024 prices didn't increase. Of course, seven hundred dollars for four days. I mean that is even with the park hopper, which is about $95, maybe $100-ish of the ticket price. It is pretty wild how expensive things have gotten, but that is where we are now. So moderate ticket price increases across the board. Now, the next thing people are going to be curious about is hotel price changes. I was completely jet lagged the day that Disney released these new prices, woke up at 3 a.m. and filmed a little reel about that. So I'm going to insert that here. And then Leslie and I are going to talk about it. So if you follow anyone Disney related, you probably know that 2025 packages are on sale. You can book 2025 for Disney World right now. And I woke up in the middle of the night because I have jet lag. So I figured I'd compare prices to see if prices have gone up or down. Picked a random weekend in June. As you can see here, the moderate and value resorts, Pop Century, Caribbean Beach Resort, looks like they went down a couple dollars per night for rack rates, while the deluxe resort went up a couple dollars per night. That's a yacht club right there. Then I took a Monday through Friday in October, the first week in October, checked again, picked a couple different resorts. Again, value and moderates went down a few bucks. 
Deluxe went up a few bucks. Looking like pricing isn't going up that much for 2025, but curious what you are seeing. If this is really what prices are looking like, that's pretty awesome because, you know, Disney always gets more expensive and so not too bad this year. Of course, if you're looking to book a trip, you can hit me up, Joseph Chung at travelmation.net. And for more Disney content, follow us, Disney Deciphered. All right. So the prices, you know, Leslie, I was in my haze, my jet lagged haze. I was like, oh, this is not too bad. This is pretty good. But then as I, as the day like wore on, you know how like when you're the first to break, not break news, I mean, let's, let's be serious here. But when you're the first to like talk about something, you don't necessarily realize like all the nuances that are coming out. As that day went on, people realized like that Disney had actually done a really sneaky change with their hotel prices. So why don't you tell us, you know, how did, how did Disney pull one over on Joe Chung at 3 a.m. on that day? So it looks at first glance like the 2025 hotel prices for at least values and moderates are a little bit less than the 2024 hotel prices. But what Disney did was it also increased the price of 2024 hotels. Didn't do that for tickets like we just talked about, but it did do that for hotels. So if you had booked a 2024 hotel several weeks ago before this price increase, it would have been less than it is today. So so they did sneak that increase in across the board and it made 2025 look good because it looked like it was less than 2024, but it isn't. Yeah, and unfortunately we can't go back in time. Like if you had booked before then, you got it a little cheaper. If you're booking now though, if you're looking at the difference between 2024 and 2025 hotels, that's pretty much a wash. Now. A quick aside here, I know people complain about how expensive Disney World hotels are, rightfully so. They are completely overpriced. But Leslie, you and I have separately decided to take our families to Yellowstone National Park this summer. And, you know, five, six hundred dollars for a lodge in Yellowstone per night that does not even have air conditioning that, you know, like it is, I mean... Yes, Disney World is expensive, but I did not expect Yellowstone to be that expensive either. And maybe like overall, Disney isn't like overpriced compared to some of the other popular destinations in the United States right now. I mean, I guess that's that's sort of fair. You know, these National Park Lodges, these really iconic ones are as expensive as the Grand Floridian. We've stayed in the Iwani at Yosemite over the years. And that is like, that's sometimes like $1,000 a night if you go during like a peak season. So, you know, and, and, and then the rooms are not as nice. I mean, we say that like the Grand Floridian isn't a luxury hotel, but I can guarantee that the Iwani is really not a luxury hotel. It hasn't been updated since like the 80s. So, so yeah, keep that in mind. But that said, Joe, Disney is located in like prime popula- population center. These national park lodges, they're in the middle of nowhere. So they have costs for just getting, you know, supplies and, and amenities to you, like, like Hawaii times, you know, times 10. So, so I'm not giving Disney a complete pass here. Yeah, they don't get a pass. And obviously the national parks, it's a totally different type of vacation. And we're I'm really excited about it. I know you're really excited about it as well. <laughs> Just as another aside, private tour at the national parks, 80% cheaper than a VIP tour at Walt Disney World. So you can throw that in there as well. On the flip side, another funny thing, Leslie, you and I were talking about it. The rental car prices are insane. Like two hundred dollars a day i mean we need a, we, we're gonna need a bigger car because we're traveling with my parents but it's um, we're looking at like maybe two hundred dollars a day again if you go to disney world you really don't need to rent a car unless you really want to so maybe you can save some money there done defending disney world though i just wanted to throw in a little aside that just to prove that leslie and i do travel to places that are not disney related uh, every once in a while but let's move on to the next change leslie did you see this change about the water park benefit do you want to explain that and give some thoughts on what you think yeah so disney is now giving this little bonus they're giving guests access to the water parks on their check-in day only so i guess for folks who get to town early and don't have anything to do that day they can go to a water park and i guess presumably maybe spend some money there and that's sort of disney's bonus but the reality is water parks are not that expensive i mean adding that onto a park hopper ticket is what like 25 bucks joe yeah, it's like less than $25 per person to add it to a Park Harbor ticket. And just on its own, it's like $70, $80 or something like that. So it's it's not that expensive. Even still, it's a nice little bonus. But I mean, for people like me who are flying across the country, like I would never be able to use that benefit. I mean, for you, you would be able to if you took a morning flight down and got into your hotel. I, I think a lot, what remains to be seen is like what the water park hours are going to be and whether it will be one or both water parks. Like, 
will the water parks be crushed and crowded during, uh, you know, peak season because of these extra people being in there? And is that a downside for, you know, other guests? I don't know. I don't know. I'm reserving judgment on this. Yeah, the other option that people have been talking about, by the way, the reason why you can't get there early, Leslie, is because you fly southwest and they don't do red eyes. Otherwise, you would be there super early. So maybe some of the other West Coast people flying other airlines, you may end up getting to use it. But I think the other thing that people have been saying, my family will not do this. But if you're doing a split stay, you know, then you can do it in the middle of the trip, you can do it on your transition day. And you know, maybe there's some value there. But again, when you're only adding $25, to a park hopper. And with that $25, if you have a four day park hopper, like that 700 odd dollar four day park hopper we talked about, if you add water parks for $25, you can go to the water park four times. I mean, I'm not saying you're gonna go four times, but that option is there. So I think it's a nice to have, I think Disney is trying to be like, hey, we're giving you stuff and they are, but it's not like, it's not like the greatest thing since sliced bread or not even the greatest thing since baked bread. I'm sure that's not a saying, but you know I've already embarrassed myself. So let's move on. All right, next change, very small change, but Disney Dish had a nice point. So I want to talk about that here. Leslie, I don't know if you listened to this, but hotel only reservations are going to move to an eight day cancellation window from a five day cancellation window. After that cancellation window, you owe like one night's hotel as a cancellation penalty. And did you catch Disney Dish's speculation, Len and Jim, why they think that this change has been made? I did. I did. And it was very wise, as always. I love that podcast. They were speculating and they had heard that the changes that are coming to Genie Plus will be the ability to make reservations seven days in advance. So this is to prevent people from booking an on-property hotel, booking Genie Plus seven days in advance, and then canceling that hotel. There likely will be some sort of a perk or, or early status for folks who were staying in on-property hotels if these Genie Plus changes ever ever come down the pike. So I thought that was that was interesting. And and that does, you know, I liked the five day. Sometimes I am changing that same week if I see some deals open up or whatever. So Disney locking you in those extra couple days, taking your money. Come on, Disney. It's safe, okay? Backside of Magic hasn't re- recorded an episode in like years. All right? So you would have been safe. We miss you, Jeremy and Ryan. But I think it is March 6th. 2024, Leslie, we're still waiting for these Genie Plus changes to not even like we thought they would be implemented by now. They haven't even been announced. So we'll see how it goes. But I think that is as good a bet as any. I think that speculation really makes a lot of sense. Maybe Genie Plus will move to seven days. And then that eight day window is preventing people from kind of hacking that system backside style. Okay. The last thing to point out, there's a two to three dollar increase per person per night on the dining plan. So the dining plan got a little bit more expensive. That is pretty much keeping with inflation because it was like almost a hundred dollars for the regular dining plan. And you add two, three dollars of that two to three percent. Even I can do that math quickly on the fly. So those are the main changes. Uh, Leslie, the second that Disney announced, they gave us one day notice. Thank you so much, Disney. Travel agents love you for this. But they gave us one day notice that these packages were going to go on sale. I was like too busy scrambling and trying to like get my stuff together. But of course, you pointed out to me the obvious reason that Disney did that in case people haven't figured it out like I didn't. Can you please share with the listeners why Disney is putting 2025 on sale so early this year. Epic universe, (laughs) universal for sure. I mean, this is Disney getting getting out ahead of all of the details that are coming immediately from the other park down the street and trying to get people to lock in those 2025 vacations at Disney instead of potentially at Universal, because the reality is there's not a lot new coming to Walt Disney World in 2025, right, Joe? What do we have? Yeah, so not a ton coming down the pipe. Tiana's Bayou Adventure will definitely be open by 2025. I mean, it could possibly be open by Memorial Day. I mean, I'm hoping it's open by Memorial Day. We have a short swing by Walt Disney World in July, so I'm hoping we can check it out then. Communicore Hall should be open by 2025. That big hall in Epcot that, you know, was originally going to be a three-story monstrosity and is much more modest now. And then, you know, just little things like Country Bear Jamboree, which, you know, we're excited about, but it's not, it's not an entire new theme park with a new Harry Potter land and Super Mario World. So I think Disney is, 
I, I am guessing that they are going to increase maybe their entertainment, the stuff that's going on in the parks, things like that. We talked about it in another episode, but they're bringing back some of the dining that still hasn't come back yet. 1900 Park Fair and Grand Floridian. So I think there's going to be little things like that. But essentially, aside from Tiana's attraction wise, like we're not seeing a lot in 2025 that we didn't see in 2024. That's totally fair. But there's a, a core group of folks who are always going to want to do Disney over Universal. So I guess Disney is locking those those folks in and maybe folks who, who will take a trip and do both, like at least making sure they do Disney and not do only Universal. I think that's what what the play is here. So we'll see if it's if it's successful. All right. So Leslie and I are going to play a little game 2024 or 2025. Before we do that, we'll take a quick break and then we'll be right back. Just a quick reminder, if you're watching this on YouTube right now at youtube.com slash at Disney Decipher, we'd really appreciate it if you could like and subscribe to the channel, comment, hit that bell button for notifications. It would really help us out. Thanks so much. All right, back to the show. All right, so Leslie, I was thinking that it is tough to decide. Most families aren't like ours. You know, They'll only go to Disney a few times in their lifetime, if not only once. Right. So it is a lot of pressure at times to decide, am I going to go this year with my family or am I going to go next year? And with the information that we have available, I thought we would just take a look at the different aspects of Disney vacations and say whether we go in 2024, 2025, or is it a wash and talk about why. So let's talk about price, Leslie. Price-wise, between 2024 and 2025, we've talked about some ticket price changes and some hotel changes. What are you thinking? 2024, 2025, or a wash? I think it's going to be a wash. I mean, at this moment, if you sort of do the math, 2025 is a little bit more expensive because of the tickets mostly being more expensive. But I fully, fully expect that there will be some hotel discounts that get released for 2025. It's too soon for that. And, you know, there are fewer hotel discounts for 2024 at this point. If you've that ship has sailed for a lot for a lot of folks on a lot of dates. So, I mean, you can still find them, but not as many. So I think it's a wash. I, I don't think you're going to be paying substantial substantially more for Disney World in 2025 than you are in 2024. I would not say the same thing for what it's worth, Joe, for Disneyland. Oh, yeah. That's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> you know, Disneyland has not released 2025 yet, and I do not think they're in any rush to do that because they don't need to lock in any dollars over there. It is bananas over there right now. I also agree that it's a wash. I Surprisingly, when I was you know doing some research for clients, I feel like I would give 2025 a slight edge. I found that this summer, a lot of the, you alluded to it already, but a lot of the discounts are like no longer available. These stay longer discounts, the room discounts, they're not available in the summer anymore. A lot of them have kind of sold out of their inventory. Of course, for the dates that they are still available, you know, bird in the hand, you can lock that in, but a lot of them are gone. But if you can't get the discount for 2024 in 2025, you said it, they're competing with Epic Universe, right? They're going to need to put some of these rooms on sale in 2025. So I think that there's a good chance that in 2025, you're going to pay less overall just because you can lock in one of those discounts. I was going to do this as a Disney do or don't, but I have a different one. So I'll say this here. Don't forget that you only need to make a $200 deposit on a Disney package. And that is fully refundable up until 30 days before your trip. Or like we said, if you're doing a room only reservation, it's fully refundable up to five days before or eight days before in 2025, you can lock in a price, give Disney a $200 loan. And if you decide that you're not going to be able to go this year or next year, whenever you make it, you know, you can kind of be a little bit flexible with that. It's not like, it's not like these national park lodges, actually the Yellowstone lodges are fully refundable, but some of the other lodging I've looked at, they are not fully refundable or they have cancellation fees and stuff like that. With Disney, you don't have to worry about that. Do not add the travel protection until final payment. We've said this like a million times, but don't do that. Okay. So that's price. Now in terms of features and attractions, 2024, 2025, or a wash for you? Kind of a wash for me as well. I don't think there's really much new. I mean, Tiana's is the, the, the thing that is new and that will be around for some part of 2024. So I guess if you're looking at going next month in 2024, I would say wait till later in the year or till 2025 because Tiana's to me is the, the only real draw of all the new things that are coming down. So yeah, there's just, unless Disney wows us with some big announcement this summer and at D23 and is able to build it fast, which they've not shown they can do this last decade, then there's just not going to be anything worth, worth waiting for. 
Yeah, it's not moving the needle at all for me. I totally agree. It's completely a wash in terms of what you're going to, especially if you haven't been for a while, right? If you're playing this game and you don't go every year, then if you haven't been for a couple of years, you like you haven't done Guardians, you haven't done Tron. The, like there's lots of new stuff for you to try. Moana, Happily Ever After is back. Luminous, whether you love it or not, is new, right? So I don't think there's a huge difference between 2024 and 2025 if you're a guest that doesn't come every year. All right, up next, crowds. This is a tough one because we're always speculating. Do you think it's going to be worse in 2024 or 2025? I'll go first. I think crowds are going to be better in 2025 just because of Epic Universe. I mean, I don't know how many people they're going to draw, and it's just wild speculation here. But like I said, the fact that I've started to see these, I honestly thought the room discounts would be around all year. I've started to see them dry up, which means 2024 is filling up. And so 2025, you might end up having better crowds. There's also... I wasn't going to do this, but I figured it was going to get too nerdy for people. The way the vacation schedules look next year, I think it's going to spread things out a little bit more because like Easter this year, Easter is March 31st, right smack in the middle of March and April next year, Easter, it's like April 20th. So it's at the very, very end of when it could be, which is going to really spread out those spring breaks because a lot of school districts are not going to be able to tie it to Easter because they're not, not going to wait that long and then have kids get out in May or whatever. So I think crowds are going to be spread more next year. Oh, and then this year we have the super long holiday break because Christmas and New Year's are both on Wednesdays. So I think Christmas and New Year's are going to be more crowded this year too. Anyway, that's my speculation. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you to a point. I mean, if you had asked me a month ago, even, I would have said crowds are going to be better in 2024, but we've already seen a little bit of an uptick, right? We've seen that these hotel discounts are filling the rooms and people are, are you know, squeezing that Disney vacation in and maybe whatever uncertainty they were worried about a few months ago has lifted a tiny bit. So I don't think the crowds are going to be super, super light for the rest of this year, but they might go down in 2025. I will put an asterisk on this, Joe, because my one concern is, yes, Epic Universe is going to draw people over to Universal in 2025, but it also is going to draw more people to Orlando, period. And I do wonder if just more human beings in that vicinity, you know, a few of them will tack on a Disney day or something like that. And that could end up bringing this to closer to a wash. But it kind of just depends on like whether the entire draw of Florida and the greater Orlando area is elevated by by the addition at Universal. We'll see. Gatorland, step up your game. But yeah, that, that's a great point. I didn't think of it that way. So I guess we will see. The next one, this one is going to be the most fun for me. Genie Plus. Let's say, let's just say for sake of argument, okay? We've gotten this wrong so many times. Who even cares at this point? If you're not a longtime listener, we were speculating Genie Plus was going to change all at the end of 2023 and it didn't change. And we had egg on our face to start off 2024. Let's say for sake of argument, Genie Plus is what Len and Jim are predicting. It's going to be, if you're an on-site hotel guest, you're going to be able to book it seven days in advance. And, you know, forget the tiers and all that stuff. I'm sure there will be tiers, but let's just say that you're going to be able to book in advance. Would you rather go in 2025 with Genie Plus where you book it in advance or 2024 where you book it live? What do you think, Leslie? Oh, this is really tough because we don't know what 2025 or whatever the changes are actually going to be. The devil, you know, um, is kind of. You what took I'm the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> you took the like. That's exactly the phrase that I was going to use. We know each other so well, Joe. All these years of podcasting together, we're reading each other's minds. But I mean, I know how to work Genie Plus. I know how to hack it. We've released all these episodes to help you who are listening do the same. I always fear change because change could make things so much worse. It could make it less hackable. Right now, I'm getting in enough rides for what I want to get in with Genie Plus. Like, I wish it was better. I wish it was good as, as good as Disneyland's, but like I'm doing everything I want to do at Walt Disney World, having to work it. It is terrible to have to wake up before 7 a.m. or I guess, you know, stay up past midnight. I don't like that feature of it, but that's really the only super negative that I think will be alleviated by this change. But But there could be more negatives heaped on this in 2025. What about you, Joe? Yeah, same. You took the words right out of my mouth. I also think that more people... You don't have to know the system to book seven days in advance because you will book something, right? Whereas when you are, for lack of a better, I mean, 
the unfair thing about Genie Plus is it gives an advantage to people like us because we know how the system works and we can be way more efficient with it. When you have seven days in advance, I mean, it's going to be better for the average guests because, you know, they're going to, like, even if they just book Muppets Vision 3D or something, maybe that's too far of an extreme example, but, you know, they just, they book one or two attractions, like, those are getting taken out of circulation before we have a chance to do our morning mad dash or you know whatever we're gonna whatever nonsense we're gonna get up to when we're trying to book these genie plus reservations i also think that another reason why i prefer 2024's version is like i do not think that disney is going to actually raise the prices we've talked about it a few times here if they made genie plus 150 dollars a day like express pass at universal it's going to price out a lot of people. I think in that situation, if you're reserving attractions in advance, that'll make a big difference. But because I don't expect them to really seriously increase the price, I think they're just going to keep it ticking up and it's going to be, you know, they're just boiling the frog, right? So people are going to still keep buying it, but now they're going to be able to book their attractions in advance. And yeah, I think the devil we know, at least for us and listeners of this podcast is going to be better. All right. The last thing we need to consider is age of your family, depending upon how old your kids are, et cetera, et cetera. Should you go in 2024 or 2025 or is it a wash? I think unless you are sneaking a kid in for free in 2024 because they haven't turned three years old yet, I think it's a wash. I feel like Disney works for any age. It is, I'd like the, you know, my kids are getting older. You're again, a couple years ahead, but I, at every age, there's something new that the kids really enjoy and that the kids really love. So, you know, the more I think about it, even if you're a family that's only going to go to Disney World once in your entire lives, like, I don't think there's a sense in timing it, except for, you know, (laughs) you don't want that one time in your entire life to be when your child is in diapers, right? But besides that, I feel like it is, there's so many things. I mean, this is why Disney World is so great. There are so many things that appeal to just kids of different ages and people of different ages. You know, we're going on a multi-generational trip in a couple of weeks and I'm thinking about how to like accommodate my parents and what they need, but Disney has something for everyone. So to me, it doesn't really matter unless I guess it's if your child is going to be free and you know, that's so they're on the cusp of turning three or if your child's on the cusp of being a Disney adult and you have to pay double for them for food, even though they eat nothing. Fair enough, but the food thing is a little bit hackable. I mean, you know, like counter service, you're buying, like you can buy a kid's meal for your 11 year old or something like that, because I do it, I do it. But the ticket savings are not that significant at the nine and 10 year old break. So I wouldn't let that drive it. I think the the free is the bigger, is the bigger savings for, for families. But, but I will say something here. I mean, I agree it's a wash, but as somebody who has a high schooler now, we are seeing very closely like when she's going to be in college and and out of the house there's no time like the present like i wouldn't put off vacations with your family whether it's disney or anything else because these years are short and i am feeling it i am feeling like i am looking ahead to the calendar for the next school year every three-day weekend every holiday trying to maximize because there are only so many more trips anywhere that i get to take with my oldest before she is on her own and being driven by her own schedule. That's just sort of my philosophical words for those of you, Joe and, and others who have younger kids is seize it. Leslie, you know, I hate it when you bring this stuff up. Okay. <laughs> why you gotta, why you gotta end us on such a big downer, but yeah, I totally agree. I mean, that's why, you know, we're going to the national parks this year. My kids are super excited about it. That's why we do our Disney trips, any travel, any, you know, any time, even staycations, like any time you can spend with your kids while they're still young, while they still listen to you, while they still respect you <laughs> as adults, human beings, you know, that is, okay, we're too philosophical at this point. All right, Joe, well, less philosophy, more tips. Why don't we close it out with our traditional Disney do or don't? Okay, so my Disney don't, with a caveat. Leslie, you mentioned that people are going to be in Orlando to visit Epic Universe and they might swing by Disney for a day. My Disney don't is if you can afford it and if it works for your family, don't swing by either Universal or Disney when you are on a trip to Orlando. I just find that the costs are like, you know, even to go to Universal, actually to go to Universal, like for 
one or two days, it's going to be 180 to a couple hundred dollars per person. And it's just so much cheaper to buy an extended ticket that I find, you know, I have clients who will ask me and they'll be like, hey, can I do a day at Universal? And I'm like, yeah, you can. It's going to cost you $240 per person. Or you can add an extra day to Disney for like $40, right? Because when you're going from five to six, seven day tickets, you know, that incremental cost is so little. And then when you think about, you know, unless you can be there for like two weeks and you're going to move, but my Disney don't is don't try to tack Universal or Disney onto a Universal or Disney trip. Think of them as two separate trips. Take two separate trips down to Florida if you can. Obviously, that doesn't work for everybody. For some, if this is your one trip to Florida in your entire life, then you're going to have to make do. But if you can, think of Universal and Disney separately. I think you will. It's not, it's not just money. I think it's also just your mentality and learning a new system while you're on the fly, while you're on your forced March of Happiness vacation. Try not to do it if you can avoid it. Yeah, it's a lot to add that learning two systems. And it would be even worse, I would say, if you're doing like a Florida trip elsewhere and then you're adding on like a day at Universal and a day at Disney. Like that's the worst of all worlds because you've got all these systems to learn. You're going to pay the absolute highest price. So so make it a theme park vacation and preferably one. And if your budget is limited, yeah, that extra incremental day that you might add to a long Disney ticket is very low, same at Universal, but if you then go to another theme park, you're going to be paying out the wazoo. Yeah, and then with Universal, like it's so with Disney, it's once you get past 5 days, it's really cheap. With Universal, it's like once you get past 2 days. Maybe it'll change with Epic Universe, but Universal like all the time, at least in 2024, <laughs> you know, if you're going to ask me if you should go to Universal in 2024 or 2025, if you want to save money, you should go right now. This is the cheapest Universal is going to be. But Universal is constantly doing buy 2 days, get 3 days free tickets like all the time. So it's like 5 day tickets for the cost of 2 days. So stick with one park, you're going to you're Overall, not only wallet, but also mentality wise, you're probably going to be happier. All right. Well, that does it for this episode, Leslie. I know you have both Disney and Universal content on your website. So where can people find your writing and also you on the internet? I am tripswithtikes.com and at tripswithtikes everywhere on social media. Where can folks find you, Joe? You can find me at As Joe Flies all over social media. And you can also find me, Joseph Chung, at travelmation.net if you're looking to plan a trip to Disney or Universal. If you'd like to connect with the podcast, at WWDeciphered on Twitter. You can also find us on Instagram, Disney Deciphered. Also, email us anytime, DisneyDeciphered at gmail.com. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And other than that, Leslie, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. And I will see you starting to crunch the numbers between 2024 and 2025. Thanks, Joe.